very complicated red cell contraptions, which is interesting for those of you who, who understand very complicated red cell contraptions. But those of you that don't understand really complicated red cell contraptions, the whole process can be a little bit confusing. That's where this video co comes in hand. Now, don't get me wrong. You can still be very confused and interested at the same time. But you would be more interested if you were less confused. I believe this is the most confusing start of a non-confusing video that I have ever made. But I am going. But today I'm going to be running through 21 redstone circuits that I personally think are incredibly useful and that every Minecraft player should know. Circuit number one: automatic item shooter. This thing essentially what it does is it detects when the droppers filled up with items, making use of this comparator. And then this, including this piece of redstone dust, not this one, not this one, this repeater and this redstone dust create a redstone clock. With this redstone dust right here, powering this repeater, causing this dropper to gradually spit out his, uh, its items. Now, this is only one of the designs. There's multiple designs, but this is useful for automatic farming setups. This is useful for item elevators. Basically, any place that you're transporting items, these things come in handy. This design is really cheap, consisting of three pieces of redstone dust, two repeaters, and one comparator, and a handful of building blocks, and then your dropper. Mm. It's it's pretty good, pretty good. And then next up, we have the a type of button selector panel. Okay, so button selector panel. This button selector panel is is a. This is what I. I like to use this when I want to activate various different parts mm. of my base, and I have want to have a clear indicator whether or not if they're activated or not. It's a button selector panel, though, but it's just high because it has a redstone lamp. So when we press this button, then it, currently our melon farm is on. If we press this button, we'll turn on our sugar cane farm. And if we press this button, we'll turn on our bamboo farm. If we press this button, it'll turn off our sugar cane farm. And then if we repress these buttons, it'll turn off our um, bamboo farm and our melon farm. So this thing here makes use of one wide tie level T flip flops. I'm not gonna I'm gonna break that down. One wide means the actual circuit itself is one wide. Tileable means we can stack them next to another. Now, here I have three. You can have as many as I want. And I'm not going to say what T-flip-flop means because we will be running through multiple different designs of a T-flip-flop after, after a little bit after this. The T-flip-flop designs, you see, the T-flip-flop designs are right here. One, two, and three. But I will explain what they do after this. But anyway... So over here, so the way it works is when you press this button, it activates the T flip flop, giving us a comparator output, and press, and then it get, activates this redstone dust, which is it's gonna activate this one or this one. Now we could put redstone dust down here instead of three repeaters, but I didn't, say, I didn't want to do that. So yeah, but still you can do that, and then which and then. These sides that have repeaters, they power these redstone dusters, and on those side too. And this one has redstone dust here, so it just runs across and powers this. And yes, that is how it works. And this here, the only thing that makes this special is because not only are we taking it out from the back, that doesn't make it special, but we're running an input black into the redstone lamps, so we have a clear indicator of whether or not our key flip-flop is toggled on or toggled off. Anyway, the next thing we have is, right, another button selector panel. I bet you thought that we were done with button selector panels in my, in, in this video, but this one is ever so slightly different. Also, it's a little bit more compact. In Java Edition, I can place these observers facing downwards, and then sticky pistons were, were right here, and right here, and here. Repeaters right here, repeaters coming output from here, and then we could destroy these two blocks, but I'm not playing Java Edition right now, but I do play it. Something happened to my account, and now I can't play it. And then we'll create a T flip flop that is considerably simpler. So if you're playing Java Edition, you should probably try that. But I play this edition more often and for now. But anyway, this over here makes it is, is when you press this button, it turns on. It turns on our circuit when we press the button again. 
it turns it doesn't turn off because it does not have a t-flip-flop design activated now i'm going to switch out my button so this makes a little bit more sense because this this button is not doing the same thing that all the other ones are doing oh i broke it okay please please let this be simple it's just a fence a fence that goes under the ground okay fine it's not a fence it's not a fence that goes under the ground what did you think and now we will take out our item and put them back in there and then we can destroy these blocks you know what for now on i'm gonna hold a sword i think because i can't break anything well, i'm just gonna do this on survival so if i do break it it doesn't break as quick but anyway so if we press this button then it will turn on if we press a different button then that one will turn on this one will turn off yeah you see it's a one output button selector panel that can't be turned off unless we press this button they all turn off so the way this works is no matter what button we press this makes use of an rs null actual rain now i'm not going to explain that because i have it over here and we will be explaining that later in the video just like the t flip flops are really close to that and then so no matter what button we press, this redstone line gets activated, which triggers the off part of the T flip flop. I mean, of the R S no actual rain. This is not a T flip flop. Sometimes I get confused. And then the button that's behind the button, the, the redstone torch behind the button that we have pressed is going to trigger the on part of one of the R S no actual rains, giving us a singular output that corresponds to the button that we just pressed. And then. Next up, we have the key carrier. If you've ever wanted to make a part of your base more secure, then this is probably one of the best ways. I would say inside of this dropper, we have our specific key card. If I put in any other item and press the button, that redstone dust doesn't activate, which means absolutely no redstone output. But if we enter our correct key card and we press the button, the redstone dust does activate. I'm talking about this redstone dust right here. The redstone dust does activate, giving us a key card reader. Any other thing we put in besides this key card, it won't work. So the way this works is out back, we have a item filter, which is only accepting these key card items. If I try to shift, click in any of these other items, they won't go in because there's not enough space. But the reason that it's not draining items, even though it's going in here, is because it's clocked. But the reason that we have to put in 18 plus 4 is because then, when we put in our correct key card, because 19 plus 4, that equals 23, and 18 plus 4 equals 22, then it will activate two pieces of redstone dust when we get it when we get 19 plus 4, that equals 23, which we'll activate two pieces of redstone dust. We can also have a compare chart right here, but I like having a repeater, which will then activate this redstone dust, because then I can show you guys that the redstone dust is powered because it sends a really weak signal, signal strength that's as weak as this, which then deactivates this redstone torch, allowing one item to go back in here, making it so one of our key cards goes back inside of there. Good grief, I don't know if that made any sense. But anyway, next up we have the hopper minecart unload, I mean, the hopper minecart loading station. So what this does is this hopper is going to, this hopper minecart is going to take items from this truck. And the amount of items it's going to take is set by this hopper. And here we have two stacks of items. So we should get around about two stacks of items. Or at least two of the, at le or at least two, these two slots should be filled. The other slides, not, the other thing, the other ones not, should not be filled. We may get under 64 in the second 64, but still. We set it off our hopper minecart. As you can see, it's filling up. Everything fills up incredibly quickly. And it's still filling up. <laughs> and now that's a big enough signal strength for it to go off. And there goes our hopper minecart. Off to plug and pick and seed for the rest of its valuable life. Now, what if we only... Now, I'm going to reset down a new hopper minecart. Because... In case... And then... But what if you only want it to make it go out when it's full? Then... 
then you can make use of this circuit just into the side instead of a comparator such as subtraction mode also this block has to be here otherwise when this chest extends to put it above the hopper it'll, it'll just punch the hopper minecart in here and then <laughs> the entire circuit will break you'll have to destroy the hopper minecart replace it and then place the block there to prevent that unless you're playing java edition place the chest here and and then it, you can place a chest, a double chest. Even you just have to place a chest on right here. But I like to use a double chest. Anyway, but right here, inside of here, we have a signal strength of 15 running into the side. Now, I'm going to place down a hopper minecart over here. So, the way this, I'm just going to do the roughest explanation of what the comparator is doing. So, this comparator, this is the same thing for this one and this one. This comparator is comparing. The only time that we're going to, but even though it's increasing its signal strength, the more items that go in here, the more items that go in here, the higher the signal strength is when it's on the detector rail. Now, this has to be a detector rail also. And it has to be going down like this because the hopper minecart will sort of hit against this block and stop but then since it's facing down it causes it to go some momentum but it can't run into the block so then when the since on it spins it causes it to keep going but anyway and then the roughest explanation is then so even though it's increasing its signal strength because for it to get a compare chart we need a detector rail even though it's increasing its signal strength we're not going to get an output because this is a comparator it's comparing the only time we're going to get an output is when the signal strength coming out of here is greater or equal to the signal strength coming into the side of there so now i'm going to test it a second time and see if that does it slightly better if it does it better, okay. Doesn't. Okay, it doesn't do it any better. It doesn't matter. Okay, I was seeing if it mattered if it was on subtraction mode or not. And it doesn't, but I like putting it on subtraction mode. And also because I like putting it on. So the same thing for this one, but only it doesn't have, but only the signal strength is controllable. If we have a hopper minecart, we can we can change our signal strength radius, whereas this, we just always have it 15. And then what happens is it should get filled up with items. This one, when we have the full thing, then it gets exactly 64 in every slot, not under, not over at all. Also, everything fills up incredibly quickly, as you can see. It's filling up incredibly quickly. I tell you when it's full. A few inches later, okay, it's almost full, it's almost full, and a few inches later, okay, it is full now, it is officially full, and now it's going off right here, I'm gonna break it, collect all the items, and also I've recently found a use for these things in super smelters, any place that can transfer in items, these things also come in handy a lot. And then we have the Hopper Minecart Unloading Station. This is essentially the direct opposite of this. So this chest, items from this hopper are going to come out in this chest. But if we have no items in this in this Hopper Minecart, then the Hopper Minecart comes back to us. If we have items in this Hopper Minecart, then it doesn't come back to us. The items go in here. So the way this works is the way that it functions that if there is items in there, that if there is items inside of this thing, it stop. If there isn't, if there is items inside of this thing, it stops because when there are items inside of this hopper, there's just taking items from this hopper minecart. It's gonna give a compare trap, deactivating this redstone torch, deactivating the minecart rail, the powered rail, which is gonna hold the minecart in place. But then, when all of the items have drained from the hopper into here. Then, then, uh, then we're not getting any comparator output, which means that the hop that, that that it deactivates. No comparator output. Reactivates powered rail. No comparator output, and it goes back to where it started at. And then we have the piston feed tape. The, I'm only going to be featuring two pit types of piston feed tape, but there's more than just two, by the way. This thing here looks quite big, scary, and complicated, but I can guarantee you it's not really that complicated. When you press this button, it's going to send a one-tick pulse through the circuit, which is incredibly quick, as you can see, which 
and that pulls first runs into this piston and this piston. This piston pulls this way, this piston pushes. Then four ticks after that happen. This, there'll be no block here. This piston, this piston, and there'll be no block here. This piston pushes a block here, so there's a block here. And then the same time that that happens, this piston pushes its block over here, so it's worked directly in front of this piston so it can push its block so it can push its block again so then it just creates an uh, endless cycle of blocks now one thing i want to say this is one of the most useful types if you want to have a bench swapper but you but but you need it to not only swap through two block through two blocks because block swappers only swap through two blocks then you can make use of this little this little guy and it and it has one two three four five six seven eight things eight things it can swap through and it has lots of it has eight things you can swap through not a whole lot but not a whole little a it's better than nothing you agree and then the next thing i have is did you say piston fee tape now we have a smart piston this thing right here is useful for tree farms cobblestone generators essentially what it does is it's a system that detects the block and immediately moves it out of the way. Now it's quite self-explanatory on how it works, but I'll quickly explain it to you guys that it just in case you need extra clarification. When the block pops in above the piston, this redstone torch powers the block, which powers this redstone dust, which powers this block, which powers this piston, which pushes the block into right here, which makes which then deactivates everything. Then we have RS Null Actual Rain. So this is an RS Null Actual Rain. We had it inside of this circuit over here. It's an incredibly cir simple circuit, but it's also incredibly useful. Essentially what it is, it's a circuit that can only be turned on from one side. If we hit this button, our per output turns on. If we hit it again, it's not gonna turn back off, but it's not gonna turn off. If we hit this button, they'll turn off. If we press it again, it's not gonna turn back on. And this is a T flip flop. This makes use of use of cycling items. So does these three T flip flop designs. T flip flops makes the pulse become a constant output. Uh, oh my god, are you just running load? <laughs> makes a pulse be a constant output, which essentially in a pulse is like coming from a button. The constant output is like the output from a lever. So essentially what it does is it makes a button work like a lever. We press this button, our output toggles, and then we press the button again. The output toggles again, and then we press the output. And on this one, this is another key flip flop design that's slightly better, I think. I press the button, it turns on. Press the button again, it turns off. And then we have this even better one. It's simpler, and the button can be placed at the top, not the bottom. And when we press the button, then it dispenses it, it turns on, press again, it toggles. Nothing too exciting, but a lot of people don't know that there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of designs, unless you're like really good at redstone like I am. I'm a redstone professional out there. And this is a type of piston feed tape. It's kind of a mix of smart pistons and also piston feed tape. Because when we, press it, when we press this button, all we have to do is activate this piston, and then the system does the rest through a series of smart pistons. This, these three pistons are all smart pistons. They're detecting the movement of blocks. When this piston extends, this observer realizes it. This observer realizes that observer realizing it it and realizing that which causes the piston to its thin which causes an update to this which is the same thing powering this which causes an update to this which powers this piston if you wanted to do this a little bit simpler then we could have also did this but i just decided to opt for this right here essentially what it does is it creates us a smart piston feed tape now you're probably wondering why i don't use smart piston feed tapes that often one reason is because we have one less block in the same amount of space you see we have one block here one block here and one block here and this one it only has two empty spaces and also it, they're a tiny bit slower but they're still incredibly useful 
Piston feed tapes are a little bit weird, and I can't name when you're gonna find use for them. But eventually, you will find a use for them, even if it just look really, really cool. Anyway, we have anyway water elevator. Essentially, what this does is, as I'm sure that most of you know, is you put soul sand underwater, then you go up through it quickly, and if you put a magma underwater, you go down through it quickly. What this elevator does is it makes it so when we want to go up it, the soul sand is there, and when we want to go up it, there'll be soul sand there, and when we want to drop down it, the magma is there for us. But when we want it, we will go up through it incredibly quickly. And then our magma is back to walk down it, and then not have to work without clicking. We don't have to even click shift or anything, and then walk in. And then we come up through it quickly, and now we fall down. The way this works is we have a block swapper connected up to a pulse extender. This is the pulse extender part, and this is the block swapping part. Now to a block swapper makes it so we can swap through two different blocks in, in between. So then, now if your water elevator is bigger than mine, which I certainly hope it is, you're gonna you're gonna have to extend your pulse extender by adding more comparators. Another comparator facing this way, another comparator facing this way, and then your two pieces of redstone just here. And then even bigger, you place redstone just right here. Then you have two comparators right here, and even bigger, you just yeah, I think you get the pitch of it. But anyway, and. The block swapper makes it so we can swap through two blocks. It takes the output from our pulse extender, and it triggers this piston two ticks later. This extends our pulse for two for two ticks, so this redstone torch stays deactivated for three ticks because redstone torches have a one tick delay. So then this so then this makes it so it can it does it. It stays deactivated longer than it activates. It doesn't take three ticks to activate. And the pulse extender, essentially what it does is it takes the pulse from our pressure plate and it extends it, as you can see. Now, you can get some pretty long pulses if you watch my 50 redstone. If it, Now, I haven't actually posted that thing, that, that video yet, but I'm going to post it soon. Next up, anyway, next up we have what's known as a grass path because Essentially what this does is let me grab a shovel and then when we grab this. Now just in case you didn't know, if you till if you take a shovel and you right click or tap with your with your finger on um, uh, on the ground, then you can turn this, then you can turn the ground into grass path and with the hoe you can turn it into farmland like this. I'm sure more of you know the farmland than the grass path. I'm sure about that. But anyway, what this redstone contraption here allows us to do is it, is it makes it so we can detect when a player turns it into farmland or grass path. As you can see, grass path, our redstone now the toggles. This, a redstone lamp turns on, extends a one tick pulse, which means you're gonna have to set this repeater to two ticks. If you're playing Java Edition, you're gonna have to do that. And as you can see, it's a one tick pulse. If we do a hoe, it has exactly the same effect, but it's but it's safe, but the piston stays extended for slightly longer. But the way this works is when this grass block here or dirt turns into a, um, a farmland let's say the piston instantly extends because farmland and grass path are transparent blocks no redstone signals can flow through them so then when we deactivate this the redstone signal turns off turning on this activating our hidden activation device and and, and returning this back into a normal block and into dirt and make sure that if you hook this up to a pulse extender and then a hidden entrance, you take the output from this torch and you make sure that you repeat that you have a repeater set to four ticks. Because like I said, with the pulse extenders, if you run a, um, a observer one tick pulse into it, then it will create a redstone clock, a interesting redstone clock that only runs for a specific amount of time. And you don't want that to open your door. You don't want it to be open and closing, open and closing, open and closing, open and closing. If you have a flush piston door, then essentially it, it might break. So you want to 
And so you want to hook it up to a 4 tech repeater connected up to a pulse and cinder if you do a pulse and cinder even. But I would do a pulse and cinder. Anyway, next thing we have is called a drop evader. This is a form of item elevator. Essentially what we do is we fire droppers in, a in the correct order to send the item from the bottom all the way up to the top. So when we turn on, so I've currently locked this hopper so none of the items are gonna be flowing into the droppers. It is a little bit noisy. On Java Edition, there's a design that is tickless, but I'm not playing Java Edition right now. Because I, like I said earlier, something happened to my Java Edition. And it's going to start giving us lots and lots. And now we had 64 wool blocks inside of here, 64 yellow wool blocks. So we should get 64 at the top. If not, we might get 63, but I think we're getting 64. 64, and now we have all of our wool blocks from the bottom back into the top chest. So the way this works is first, now this thing can be expanded vertically upwards. So if we just put another dropper, compare to our output, compare to output, compare to output, another, another, another. But it can be expanded infinitely as long as high as you want it, all the way up to the building limit. And yeah, because we have a building limit in this edition too, not just stop edition. But anyway, but anyway, so the way it works is first, first of all, these are automatic dropper systems. When an item goes in here, this compares to realizes it. This creates a clock causing it to gradually not gradually to in immediately spit out its items, which makes it so we have an automatic dropper system, and it also powers this right here, and it powers uh, this dropper and this dropper, but then once it gets up to this point, it, it doesn't, we are not getting a compare, we, it, it's not gonna go any higher, so then this does a compare to output. Now this can be a compare to or repeater, but you cannot just place redstone dust here, no, that won't work. And then this observers are creating a clock. This right here is powering this. And this compared to here is, is also powering this, causing it to the items all the way from the bottom and right to the top. Then we only have four redstone contraptions left to show you. Just in case you are wondering when this video is going to end. <gasps> I know, it's quite a long video. It's already been 27 minutes and 30 something, 32 seconds. Anyway, I'm just looking at the hitboxes. Well, never mind. No, no. That's not what you call it. But this is a Falling Edge Anvil Repair Station. Let's say our anvil broke. Yeah, we get it. We And we're going to go grab a new anvil. Everybody knows that anvil repair stations are cooler. Now, did you, fun fact about anvils. Anvils are more expensive than you wearing a full set of iron armor. So you're going to need quite a lot of iron. Um, a, a lot of iron. But anyway, when we press the button... Falling edge of our pulse, that's when the pulse ends, when the button pops back up, it gives us an output, then then, then this thing will, I mean, will give us a new anvil, as you can see this does not have to be set to two ticks, if we're playing Java edition we can destroy this redstone dust, and if we press the button again, same effect, Falling edge, new anvil. What if we want a rising edge? A rising edge is white as soon as we press the button. Then we can build this circuit. This here does it at the rising edge. When you press the button. Okay, I forgot. When you press the button. Okay, if I can actually press it. New anvil is immediately given to us. The way this works is this repeater does not have to be set to two ticks. Why do I set my repeaters to two ticks when I don't have to? Sometimes I do that. When we do, this repeater activates, it turns off this redstone torch, which deactivates this pistons. But two ticks after that, it takes one tick to do that. So two ticks after that, it triggers this re-extending the piston, creating a monostable circuit of one tick because it extends and retracts really quickly. That one tick pulses really quick and makes it so it can give us a new anvil when our anvil breaks. Next up we have TNT cannon. Now did you not if you didn't know, TNT cannons that have dispensers and, and dispense TNT and then when one the last TNT and then when another piece of TNT when first some TNTs are dispensed, then another TNT is dispensed at the falling edge of the poles. It launched it. Those when we use stone wooden buttons and stone buttons, it, the pull, it, it aims it in a little bit of a different way. Let's stone button aim. 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 Stone button aim.
on what's name, it explodes earlier than wood what's name. This is due to do shortness and pulsing of buttons. A button's pull, a, a, a stone button's pulse is for 10 ticks, and a wooden button's pulse is for 15, because then that activates the redstone torch a little bit later with the stone button, but a li which means it, it activates it a little bit before the wooden button does, which makes it so so it is so it gets launched early earlier because this TNT hasn't does its flickering for the full 40 redstone ticks yet whereas the, the wooden button it gets to do five extra ticks and because TNT's fuse time that's when it's flashing is 40 redstone ticks yeah and this is another type of TNT cannon stone button aim stone button aim and wooden button aim and then redstone in will be shown. And launch. Launch. Okay, the redstone and for this we have three dispensers. And this is kind of the same thing for this one. When you press the button, first it activates these dispensers, then activates, then it deactivates the redstone torch at the falling edge of the pulse. The redstone torch reactivates, redispensing a TNT on here. Now to make it so you have the lowest chance of exploding place water under the slab so for some reason this does explode oh explode then the only block that gets destroyed is the slab or blocks like oh, that are like over here or over here but none of these wool blocks will get destroyed so yeah and then this one works in the exact same way three t's get dispensed in here at the falling edge of the pulse a tnt gets dispensed right here and it launches it now like I said, even though their aim is different, when we activate this one, and we stand right, right here, it doesn't launch us as far as we would th as as it launches the TNT. Same thing for this one. I'm using stone button aim for now, because, yeah, it doesn't launch us as far either. But these are still good designs, and that is 21 that I personally think are incredibly useful. And that you, that every Minecraft player should know. And that's everything. I am out of.